Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur Media and Yelp. My name is Sean Walsh, founder of Cali Barbecue Media. I want to give a special shout out to Toast, our primary technology partner at our barbecue restaurants in San Diego. They have sponsored this show. They believe in this project. We believe in smartphone storytelling. So turning your restaurant business into a media business. This is the Restaurant Influencers show, and we're very grateful that we have so many people that have been tuning in all over the globe. Um, we have some incredible guests coming up. We've got some huge names that are reaching out for us. They want to be on the show, so we're super grateful. But in life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Shone Tran of At Chicken Meets Rice, three-unit restaurant operator in the Bay Area. Shone, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sean. Pleasure to be here. So fired up to have you, man. You and I, um, we have connected because of Toast, primary, primary sponsor of this show. Because of their technology, you are on the customer advisory board as well as I am. Um, let's start with technology. Can you, uh, can you tell us how did you get on the customer advisory board? You know, I got on the customer advisory board because um, someone from Toast, I think it was Catherine Kalik, um, she's a community manager at Toast, reached out to me and, um, you know, she said that Chicken Meats Rice was growing really quickly and she saw that we were leveraging a lot of the different um, Toast solutions. And so, um, you know, she told us about, told me about the customer advisory board and it was an inaugural sort of event or an inaugural um, class of people that they're putting together to help inform Toast of uh, trends that we're seeing in um, the restaurant industry and kind of help shape their roadmap and their plans for the future. It's pretty incredible. And it's something that I hope, you know, people that listen to the show or that watch the show that they take away is that no matter who you are, you are a restaurant influencer and there's never been a greater time to use your voice with your partners because it's not, this isn't a vendor relationship. This is truly a partner relationship and everybody needs to be learning. We need to be growing and technology is everywhere that we look. Can you, can you tell the audience, let everyone know what chicken meat meats rice is? How did, how did the idea come to be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, my name is Sean Tran. I'm a co-founder of Chicken Meats Rice. We are a three-unit um, premium, fast, casual Asian rice bowl restaurant based out uh, in Silicon Valley. And our concept is based on a very popular dish in Southeast Asia called Hainanese chicken rice. And the idea really first came to me and one of my best friends and now co-founder, Jonathan Sujerit, uh, during a trip of ours to New York. And frankly, we were bar hopping in Williamsburg and in between bars, of course, when you've had enough to drink, uh, you get hungry. And so we walked by this Malaysian restaurant and we went in and probably ordered three or four different things, one of which was Hainanese chicken rice. And man, it was so good. We totally devoured it. And it was so good that we actually had to order a second one, um, and even though we were full as hell already by that time. And the whole time, you know, John and I we were, you know, he was telling me about the Thai version of this dish that he grew up eating. And I would tell him about how, you know, I always ate the Chinese and Vietnamese versions of this dish uh, growing up all my life. And so we just remember thinking to ourselves, man, this dish would kill it, you know, as a concept back home in, in the Bay Area. And who knows, maybe we could do it. But, you know, there's, there's actually a, um, a part of the story that never gets told because I would say normally nothing would really have come out of a trip like that in New York where, you know, we're drunk and we're just having fun and talking about kind of shooting the shit. Um, you know, how many other times have two really great friends, you know, dream about starting a restaurant together and it never happens, right? Um, so for me, somewhere around that time, something happened that really caused me to think about my life and begin to search for meaning. Um, my dad got diagnosed with uh, stage three colon cancer, which later on progressed to stage four colon cancer. And I suddenly felt like, you know, life was so short. And I started to ask myself, you know, if working for someone else was really why the universe forced my parents to come 
to the US as refugee immigrants from Vietnam. And I can remember, you know, growing up, like my mom and dad, they would always tell me, starting a business is not for us. It's not for our family. We don't have the resources to go down a path of entrepreneurship. And I remember how like my dad would always tell me about um, the bosses that he would work for and they all happened to be entrepreneurs. And I could always tell that he looked up to them and admired them. So, you know, deep down, I just really wanted to kind of change that narrative for my family and show my own kids the American dream, which in my mind is the freedom to create your own destiny. And so, you know, that's really kind of the, the thing that turned what otherwise would have been just any other random conversation for me into something that ultimately drove me to take action with, uh, with one of my best friends, John, to create this concept. Thank you for sharing that. I'm uh, hopefully, how is your father doing? Well, he, he, unfortunately he passed away, but the good news is he actually, you know, he's a fighter and he did um, live well long enough to see me actually launch Chicken Meats Rice and uh, get to our second unit in Cooper. Amazing. So, yeah. That's yeah. My, my grandfather was thankfully alive the year that we opened up Cali barbecue in 2008. So I know how much it means for, for him to have seen, you know, the beginning of something that we were building and he was an immigrant too, an immigrant from Bulgaria. So um, talk to the entrepreneurs that are listening to the show, the people that might not own restaurants yet, or that want to own restaurants, uh, bring us back to, I mean, that's a very compelling story. And I'm happy that you told me the, the, the real story behind it. But then we always say, stay curious, get involved, ask for help. The curiosity leads to this idea of making a better life for yourself, knowing that life is short, being with your best friend, having drinks, but then they're actually ha then you actually have to do something behind it. Can you talk about the steps that you and John took to actually get this first first location launched? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, and it's something that we talk about all the time, and it's ingrained into the way that we approach our business every single day, even at this stage of our business. And that's really about starting small. You know, we truly adopted the concept of a lean startup approach. And so when we first started to conceive of this idea, we didn't just go and do something dramatic, like quit our, our decade long jobs in tech, you know, and just sacrifice everything and go, you know, find a space and, and open a restaurant, right? The first thing that we started doing was we started talking about it with each other, started talking about it with friends. And then on the weekends, you know, when we were off work, we would actually get together and start playing with recipes and cooking it for each other to taste. So John would make a version, the Thai version called Common Guy um, to show me because at that time I hadn't ever tried that version of the dish. And so we started just eating the, the version that he, he had made and then do more recipe testing every weekend. And then eventually um, we, we had some friends over one night, you know, maybe three, four, five people, and we let them try it. So we started really, really small and we got some good feedback. And then, you know, each time you get a little bit more confidence, you take a bigger step, right? And so the next step after that was, this was around January timeframe of that year, I think it was probably 2017 or so. And we cooked it for a larger party for a Super Bowl party. So maybe there were 20 people. Yep. And it was a more diverse group of people, you know, not just uh, like some of our close friends, which were Asian people, but a lot of people from different backgrounds. And so that was like a big test to see, you know, how friendly this would be, right, as a food. Yep. Um, and sure enough, everyone supported it, you know, and of course, even though everyone was smiling, enjoying the food, you always have that thought in the back of your head. Is it because they don't want to hurt your feelings? Yeah. Is it because they're your friends, you know? And so we continue to talk about it. And um, one of John's cousins, she works at a, she worked at a startup at the time and they were catering lunches to their office every single day. And so, you know, she thought of the idea, hey, how about you guys come make the food for us? And so that next step was a pretty critical step because it's, it's feeding strangers. Yes. And there's no better feeling than seeing absolute strangers, you know, try your food and connect with it and, and enjoy it. And so we, we went and catered for um, 30 people 
uh, free of charge, right? We just took a couple of days off of work at the time to prepare for it. And then um, all we asked for was feedback. You know, all we asked for was them to fill out a survey and we asked them things like, you know, what price point would they be willing to pay for it? Um, any thoughts about the taste, about the packaging and things like that. So the name of the game is start small and take one step at a time and build confidence to get to the, to the next step. Can you talk about the name? Yeah, <laughs> actually funny story <laughs> of that. So around that time, online dating was like going crazy. This is even before, you know, Bumble and Tinder was getting super hot uh, or maybe concurrently with Tinder. Um, but a lot of our friends were starting to use a service called Coffee Meets Bagel. Coffee and, Meets Bagel. I haven't heard of it. That's right. And so <laughs> somewhere, and, hey, by that time, I was already married. Okay. So <laughs> I wasn't in the market. John wasn't in the market. He, he, had, he was married and we actually just had our first uh, babies um, just probably three to five months into that. Wow. And so so um, no better time to open up a restaurant. Yeah, no better time. Yeah. But yeah, that the name was maybe in the far back of my mind, you know, and then we, we had a lot of different names. But you know, when we when I said chicken meets rice, and we just ran it by a bunch of different people. Um, it just, it felt right. I mean, I for, for me, the name is always something that it means so much, because it's really the true birth of the conception, like you have an idea for a restaurant. But then once you get to the naming stage and the branding stage, and the logo creation. Now you're starting to actually see this idea come to life. That's can, right. can you bring me to the day one when you guys opened up the restaurant for the public? Yeah, that was a crazy day. <laughs> so remember we said that, or I just said that we, we always go lean and we go with the least that we need to do, right? And so, or the smallest step we can take, I should say. And so, at that time, we had not hired a single employee yet. Okay, we we were John and I were already out of we, we left our jobs, but uh, his dad, who was retired, and his stepmom, who's Thai, uh, volunteered to come fly out from South Carolina and spend however many months with us to help get this thing launched. Um, and then we also had one of our best friends, Sunil. Uh, who is how we actually met uh, John and I in our first jobs in Silicon Valley. And um, we had literally five people and we opened up. We thought that we would not even sell 20 boxes uh, that day, okay? Because we did zero advertising. It was a soft opening. Um, we were gonna open at 11.30 a.m. that day. And no joke, at 11, there were probably already 30 people in line waiting to see what this new spot is about. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't explain. No, it. no social media? Zero. Really? Yeah. I'll say this is that we, we picked that location because um, John and I, the first company we worked at called Cypress Semiconductor, uh, it actually is like within walking distance of that, that strip plaza. So okay. we knew that area really well. It was a really sleepy strip plaza, but we knew that there are a lot of workers that already knew the area and there were like five other restaurants. And so, you know, we, we hoped that we picked a good spot, but we never knew that, you know, they would come line up for our store on the first day and not even knowing what it is, you know, like yep. chicken meets rice, you know, it's probably chicken and rice, but I mean, for all you know, it could be, you know, it could be Middle Eastern, it could be anything. So people just were curious and they stood in line and the rest is honestly history. We got destroyed that day. <laughs> we ran out of food. Uh, we, we only opened till maybe like 1 p.m. No <laughs> way. Two o'clock, yeah. Um, and then we realized, okay, we, we've got to hire. And we yeah. were there that day until probably 3, 4 a.m. Yeah. That's amazing. That yeah. Everything else. Those are the war stories. So- I would love for you to talk. We, we talk to restaurant owners all the time that we can't, we can no longer think of restaurants in the traditional sense of a standard profit and loss statement. We have to think of different revenue streams, which is why we talk about restaurants becoming media companies, looking into consumer packaged goods, um, looking into ghost kitchens, looking into alternative non-traditional locations. Can you tell us the story of 99 Ranch? Yeah, absolutely. You know, 99 Ranch um, found us, I believe they emailed 
I think one of their real estate um, agents, if you will, uh, or someone from the real estate team who looks for and scouts for new um, locations for 99 Ranch, they reached out to John um, and they told us about a new concept that they were doing, uh, some concept that they've already launched one time, I want to say in, I want to say in Southern California. And the concept was a supermarket with a integrated food court concept or a food hall, they called it. And so, you know, when they reached out to us, it was probably in the middle of 2018. We were getting a lot of success, but we were still very new and limited. Our operations were so crazy. Um, the way that we approached everything took so much space and um, was was just very immature. And when they came to us, you know, they told us that, hey, we're doing this food hall concept and each kiosk was about maybe 500 square feet. Wow. Yeah. And we thought to ourselves, you know, if we're ever going to make this work, um, if this concept is going to, to get into every corner of the US, then being able to be in a mall, for example, uh, mall food court would be uh, an important test for us. And this was the closest thing before going into a mall one day, right? Yep. Um, so so we, we uh, worked with the architects and we designed out the concept. And even to the day that we opened, honestly, we we didn't think that we could fit into such a small space. And, you know, each of our locations, we always say it's like the little kitchen that could <laughs> the amount of food that we, we crank out of there. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, 99 ranch, it's the largest Chinese supermarket chain in the United States, over 51 stores cross over seven States. And the thing that I love about that is that we talk a lot about ghost kitchens and friendly ghost kitchens, but typically ghost kitchens are getting developed and under underutilized real estate in, in the United States. So it's not a traditional food location, but what 99 Ranch is, they have such a strong brand and such a, that when they open up in a neighborhood, that's really, you know, a magnet a magnet culturally and to other cultures because there's 99 ranch here in San Diego and people are coming there. So people are coming there, they're buying their groceries, but then they have the opportunity to get food for lunch or get food uh, for dinner or even find you for catering. So it's really, it's really exciting because you're getting a double dynamic. It's forcing you operationally to change how you're doing things so that you can think bigger, but then it's also giving you a huge ability to tap into their audience. 100%. And I think, you know, looking back there, I think they were interested in us because we represent kind of maybe this um, bridge between kind of the more hardcore uh, Asian demographic that they were used to having. And then Chicken Meats Rice was this slightly, you know, more modern and hip kind yep. of brand that would pull in your non, your non, um, or your, I guess your, 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 yeah, your non-regular 99 Ranch customer into, into the store. And so people would find us via Yelp, find us via DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub, et cetera, and order pickup. And then they would come into our location and they'd be like, oh, there's 99 Ranch Market. Let me go and get my groceries for the weekend while I'm there. Right. And then vice versa, people come for their groceries, but then you know, most of the time when you're done shopping, you're tired and you might not even <laughs> yeah, want to go yeah. home and cook, right? So what better than to have someone cook for you already and you just bring home something to enjoy with your family for lunch and then maybe you'll cook for dinner. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. And I mean, I've seen that Walmart's doing it and a lot of brands are doing it. They tried to do it. A lot of grocery stores tried to do it themselves, but I think they're finding out what a lot of stadiums have found out is when you find the key independent operators out there in your local markets that have a strong community following and they care about their product, they care about their hospitality, it can really enhance the entire overall experience. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Can, can you... Uh, Talk to me how it is to have a business partner. Um, how do you have a healthy business partnership with one somebody that's one of your best friends? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think what always comes to mind is 
people are worried that you're you're risking your friendship when you you go into business together. Um, but I think you know, the thing I focus on the most, and I think the thing that John and I talk about is who better to experience something like this with, you know, um, someone that, you know, one of the people that you love the most uh, to get to experience all of these successes and, uh, and all the challenges, right, and work through them together. Um, it's just one of the most fulfilling experiences. Uh, with that said, of course, you know, like every other meaningful relationship in our lives, you have to work at it. Right? And I think, you know, we've had our ups and downs in terms of having to figure out um, how to navigate, you know, our feelings with each other, right? And navigate the way that we work together. But, the, you know, the, the one thing I'll say is I had mentioned we were new parents when we first uh, thought of the idea to do chicken meat rice and begin on that venture. Um, I feel so blessed because like, I just know there's so many times when there's stuff going on in my life. And then John just like carries the whole business on his back, you know? And yeah. then there's been times that he had challenges and without question, without any feeling of like, Oh, you know, he's doing more work or, or I'm doing more work, you know, that we just, do what's necessary to succeed because we believed in each other from the start. And, um, and yeah, we're, we're just, we're actually invested in each other's success beyond just the fact that we're 50, 50 partners. Yeah. So a show, this is a show about influence. Like I said, every restaurant owner is an influencer, whether they know it or not, it has nothing to do with how many social media followers you have, how active you are on TikTok or Instagram. But we obviously recommend that all restaurant owners be as active as possible because these are all free tools available to, to tell our story. Um, I noticed that you had an influencer visit your resta restaurant. Reina is crazy. Um, yeah. She has been to Cali barbecue as well. She oh. has over 6 million followers across TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. But then when I look at her coming and creating a video for your guys's concept, I mean, it's reaching tens of thousands of people. Can you talk about how that got set up and any advice to any restaurant owners that's looking to work with influencers? Yeah. You know, I think uh, folks like Reina and another, um, gentleman named Joel Hansen, another influencer named Joel Hansen, uh, who came by around a similar time, they often have uh, a team behind them. And, uh, you know, one of their team members reached out to us in our DMs, I'm pretty sure, and, um, and asked if we'd int be interested in doing collaboration. So that that's how it happened. Um, but I would, you know, I will say that um, nowadays, everyone is an influencer, like to your point, right? And yeah. there's a lot of um, upstart type of uh, people that are trying to do food blogs or food vlogs. And so we actually get pretty blown up in our DMs of a lot of people asking to do collabs. And, you know, I think we do actually look at them. And that was the yep. important part is to when we when, when we saw Raina and Joel come through, you know, people on our team, and even John and my, myself, we recognized those names. And we said, Hey, look, let's, you know, let's go for it, right. And, and give this a shot. So yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're just in the beginning of a whole new what we call, you know, what is the creator economy. So people that are able to come this, this used to be things that used to happen on legacy media. So these were, you know, before it was the the movie star, it was the local TV anchor, it was the radio host, or it was the, the newspaper writer, these were all the original influencers. But yeah. now because people have platforms like TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and podcasts and things like that people have audiences and it's important I think for anyone that's listening, just to understand, you have to be active on these platforms. You have to be on Instagram. You have to be on TikTok and you have to have somebody that's there to manage it because somebody that does reach out to you, if they reach out to you, or if they visit your restaurant and they can't tag you on the platform, then you're putting yourself in the opportunity where you're really going to not capitalize on, on all that influence. Um, I'd love for you to talk about personal care. It's something we don't talk about enough. Um, we're in the hospitality business. If you're listening to this show, um, you love people, you take care of people, but uh, we tend to be the, we tend to be the leaders that take care of ourselves the worst. Um, what have you done recently? Any, any habits that you've changed in your life that's helped, helped you that, that could help our audience? I mean, one of the habits that I'm working on is, um, 
is called uh, self-observation meditation. And the way that I came upon that was actually through John. And John has a life coach named Arda that he's been working with for almost a year now. And Arda has become actually our business coach. Um, and he's coached me and John, but also has helped us create, um, I guess, a program of corporate wellness for uh, our team at Chicken Meets Rice. And so all of our managers, a lot of our leads have participated in uh, various workshops, et cetera. And one of the key sort of, um, I guess, uh, practices that Arda teaches is to use various meditation techniques to create space between us and all of the crazy in our lives, right? And one of the ways to do that is this concept of self-observation -observ meditation where you, um, you sit down, uh, feet on the ground, uh, relax with your back straight and you put your hands in a, in a position that looks like this, where you rest one, uh, one in the palm of the other and you put your two thumbs together and you close your eyes and what you do is you focus on and try to clear your mind and you just focus on the sensation between your thumbs. And by doing that, you know, obviously your, your mind will always wander when you're practicing meditation, right? That's okay. Um, but when it happens and you notice that it happens, you just bring your focus back to the sensation of your thumbs. And that helps to ground yourself and helps to just um, create separation, create that space between between you and whatever else is kind of weighing you down in your life. Wow, that's interesting. And do you do that daily? A certain time I, of the day? I personally have not gone to a point where I do it daily, but I yeah. do it, you know, probably a few times a week at this point, right? And it's something that I need to really do a better job of. But every single time I do it, I always get something out of it. And I always feel 10 times lighter. My mind is clearer. And the things that were bothering me just I've got that space now. It's like, I can actually deal with it because it's not kind of um, concentrated at, you know, in my heart or my chest, which is where I feel a lot of the, um, the stress and, and anxiety um, from running a business, from having two kids, young kids and stuff like that. So the beautiful thing about the internet and about this show is that it's going to be on the internet forever. So five years from now, we can go back and uh, watch your interview on entrepreneur.com and check it out on all the social handles. Can you give us some big crazy ass goal for five years of chicken meats rice so that when you come back and you go, I didn't ask big enough. Yeah. Five years from now, Chicken Meats Rice will be a national franchise with at least 100 locations across the U.S. All right. And that is our goal. Chicken Meats Rice. Are you working on franchising? When, when do you plan on having that available? Yeah, we are working on franchising. Uh, you know, if I had to estimate, it would probably be sometime within uh, 2023 where we'll be mm -hmm. ready to uh, be able to sell our first franchise. Yep. There's all this work up until then to simplify and standardize our business so that we can enable a prospective franchisee to be successful with our concept. That's awesome. So anybody that listens to this show, um, we invite you to come to Clubhouse. Clubhouse is an audio app and we every Wednesday and Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, we have digital hospitality leaders, restaurant influencers um, from all over the globe that join us. But um, I'd love to have you shown show up and um, answer questions from our guests. We've got some incredible people that that are there on 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 the platform. Um, this week, I want to give a shout out to Dean LeBay. Uh, Dean keeps showing up. Um, he is absolutely incredible. He's been telling stories. He's been on LinkedIn. But so much of what we do, like I said, pat podcasting is a passive. You consume it. You, you if you you're not if you don't care about improving your life, you don't listen to podcasts. If you want to improve your life, improve your business, you listen to podcasts. But we want you to actually do some work, share your story. You never know if you're going to end up on this show. Um, you're going to be on Entrepreneur.com forever, which is super awesome. But Sean, I'd love for you. It's hard as business leaders, we don't get a platform, we don't get a stage to, to share a shout out. 
Is there somebody that you want to shout out? Somebody that that um, within Chicken Meats Rice that that has been going above and beyond. Within Chicken Meats Rice that has been going above and beyond. Um, great question. Put you on the spot. See that? See, yeah, business leaders, totally we don't did. we don't get to we don't get to answer this question very often. No, um, God, so many of our people go above and beyond. Uh, and yeah, I don't accept that as an answer. Yeah, I mean, okay. One person, so one person one that will person. be on entrepreneur.com and they can share it with their family and let everyone know. Yeah, I'll say most recently, uh, one of our now um, newly minted operations managers, his name is Johnny Tran, unrelated to me, but <laughs> he's doing something very difficult right now, which is transitioning from running one of our stores, which is our Fremont store, to um, going back into starting from scratch, really, uh, and starting from the bottom and helping us with all of the franchising efforts. So he's in student mode, uh, just supporting me and John and all the kind of uh, CMR wide efforts. Yep. And he's literally working day and night, um, going into discomfort and doing things that are really uh, breaking habits and, you know, just uh, going all out and sacrificing a lot of personal time with his girlfriend and family and friends to to embark on this journey with us. That's so awesome. Congratulations. Um, and anybody that's listening to this show, I want you to know you can always reach out to me or my team. It's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. And that's LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. It doesn't matter. Um, you can always find us. We're, we're here to be a resource to you. We're grateful for this stage that uh, Entrepreneur has provided for us. Sean, any, any words of encouragement for anybody that's in the restaurant business? Well, I, you know, I will say this because I do want to put it on entrepreneur.com and look back and, you know, hold myself accountable. <laughs> Good. I like it. Sean, uh, the last time he and I spent time in Boston together. At Toast uh, Headquarters. At Toast Headquarters. And we shared, you know, more than one meal together and we walked through the airport together. I got to know him real well. Um, but he inspired me greatly about social media. You know, I know it's something that we're not doing nearly close to enough of. And I think it is definitely something that all restaurant owners need to do. And Sean, I promise I, I have, yes. uh, there, there are thoughts. The chi chicken, my chicken meets rice. But by the time this drops, you'll have a TikTok account. A uh, TikTok account. We might already have an account, but have okay. we anything? No, we're, posting I, 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 we're posting daily by the time this episode drops. Yeah. Th but there's content that we are thinking about and like, you know, it's, it's getting video, quick, video, back, video, yeah. short form video. Authentic is the key. I yes. think it's what you really helped me see. And so, you know, we're not going to go and just hire someone and solve the problem. No, nope. it's got to come from me, me and John, and it's got to be organic and authentic and then come from our team. Yeah. I absolutely love it. Sean, you're an inspiration. Um, anybody you can reach out to Sean, we'll put links in the show notes so you can go visit Chicken Meats Rice if you're in the Bay Area. Um, be sure to tag us as well when you go and check out his food. But um, Sean, thank you, brother. I appreciate your, your wisdom and your time. Thank you so much. I miss you, man. Hope yeah, we get to see too. each other soon. We'll, we'll see you soon. All right, All right, you guys. Stay curious. Get involved. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And you guys, we'll catch you next week. And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poonkinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept, or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use, and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. 
I will get you the link to the right toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show that you win. We want you to be on this show eventually. Let us know that you heard the show, you heard about toast, you implemented toast, you did a toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community. Share your toast story with us. DM me today to learn more and be sure to check out toast.